I'm not an interviewer. I'm just an ordinary uh, PhD in political science. You got it all going? You ready? So um, ICNC asked me this morning to interview two incredible leaders in um, nonviolent conflict about leadership, about what leadership means, about their own leadership experience, and about leadership skills. So you're understanding okay? okay. And the reason they asked me is that I do teach foreign policy leadership in a program called the Global Master of Arts program. And Dan has taken my course on historic leaders. <coughs> but they're very different kinds of leaders than the leaders you find in civil resistance movements. So this is a great honor and privilege for me to interview extraordinary uh, people who have had such an impact. It's research for me. Um, it's, it's a learning experience. So I don't have the answers. I just have a, a list of questions. And I think you're fully welcome. <coughs> I heard you speak. And I watched you on the force more powerful. So I don't think I have to worry about an interesting um, session this morning. The first question I want to ask is not on my approved list. But I have to ask it, which is, what made you begin as a leader? What was the tipping point? Was it a slow process? Was it a moment in time? What was it? Do I start? No, with me it happened by accident. А, потому что я вообще на тот момент я очень долго работала в бизнесе. Я такой вот, я как Питер, вот такой же бизнесмен, только не так много денег заработал. I have been involved in business for several years. And I'm like Peter, I'm a business woman, but I just wasn't able to make as much money. <laughs> И я ждала тогда второго ребенка и решила, как следует отдохнуть. Я решила, хватит мне работать, но сколько можно? Десять лет. At that moment I was expecting my second child and um, I thought, uh, well, maybe that's enough. I have been working all my life. Maybe it's time for something else, for something different. И вот представьте себе, я гуляю со своим животом замечательным по лесу и нахожу вот эти красные пятна на деревьях, которыми разметили наш лес под проект трассы через Химкинский лес. So imagine me walking in the forest with a huge belly almost uh, about to give birth and here I see those red marks uh, that uh, were on the trees in the Himki forest uh, and those marks indicated uh, the path where the highway was supposed to go to run. Ну, конечно, я решила, что это какая-то ошибка, что чиновники просто не знают, что у нас тут такой лес замечательный. I decided it was some kind of mistake. Uh, the um, bureaucrats just don't know that we have this wonderful forest that is, uh, brings people so much joy. И я написала тут же там миллион писем в разные инстанции, что э, у нас лес, вы знаете, и вы нарушаете закон, нельзя здесь дорогу строить. Прям ссылки на законы давала, такие длинные, очень трогательные письма с цитатами из Толстого. Uh, I uh, wrote a million letters uh, saying, uh, you can't do that, we have this wonderful forest. Uh, I uh, made the references to the law, huge quotes from this law, almost like quoting from Tolstoy. И все это закончилось тем, что мне ответили такую вот маленькую отписочку. Все как под копирку писали, знаете, как будто я down. Отвечали мне одну фразу: проект принят на принят на уровне президента Путина. Следовательно, он законный. Как будто Путин это такой вот выше закона, такой бог, который может делать все, что он хочет. And uh, I kept getting uh, little responses. They all sounded the same. They were almost like form letters. And what they said was that uh, this project has been approved by uh, Putin. And it sounded like Putin was uh, God and whatever he says goes. 
So I decided that I have to get involved. А у меня уже времени было много, ребенок уже родился к тому времени. I had plenty of time at that time. I had delivered my baby. Я что, она все время ест, спит, а я тем временем, значит, сделала на домашнем принтере э, такие э, объявления, э, расписала эти проблемы, оставила там свой мобильный телефон, и пока гуляю с колясочкой, я их везде вот леплю, клею, а другой рукой собираю подписи в защиту вес. So my baby was only eating and uh, drinking. I felt that she didn't need me that much. So I printed those things at my home printer and I explained the issues. I gave my cell phone there and I was posting those leaflets everywhere in the forest and uh, collecting with one hand and collecting signature, signatures with my other hand. Ну вот это так вот все было постепенно. Сейчас моя дочка, которая тогда в коляске лежала, уже 7 лет. Uh, so the process uh, unrolled slowly at that time, and uh, it was seven years ago. My uh, second daughter is almost seven years old now. И я себе каждый раз говорил, ну так, сейчас подписи соберу и завязываю. Хватит, останавливаю. I kept telling myself, uh, so I'll get some more signatures, and then I'm gonna stop. Вот сейчас митинг проведу и все завязываю. I told myself, okay, this one last meeting I'm gonna organize, and then I'm gonna stop. И вот что-то втянулось. But I never saw. Похоже на, знаете, как вот наркотики принимаешь, уже вот не можешь остановиться. You become like a drug addict in a good sense. So, my buddy Christopher. Well, I think that every individual got ingredients of leadership in him. And um, how to sustain and uh, rise up to the top is through conviction in something. And uh, I think that's how I personally came into maybe the was like as I say, <coughs> elements of leadership in everybody. <coughs> Then you need something to to poke it, and then it can you go on. But I don't think it works when you set up yourself out to be a leader. <laughs> I think uh, organic leaders are those who allow the natural process to take place through this mechanism that I'm talking about, mainly uh, commitment and uh, being exemplary at all times and always make sure that you are the same, you don't change, today you look like that, tomorrow you look like that. And also good leaders or people who will be good leaders and people who know that one of the serious things that you shouldn't have mustn't be a moody person. Oh, moody. Moody. <laughs> moody. <laughs> you know? Or people who tend to misunderstand people. You, you come to conclusion without understanding. I mean, there's nothing wrong you don't have to understand everything that is said from the first go, but try then. It's not a sign of weakness to go back and say, listen, I didn't understand what you were saying, and then that actually will strengthen you. As you know, they say, um, to be conscious that you are ignorant of facts is a great step to knowledge. So basically, that's how and I find myself in leadership position through that road. I, hold, I came to Port Elizabeth, to the city, to get education. That's it. And what poked you? <laughs> you said something that poked you. What poked me was the a moment you arrived. The moment I was, uh, I was sitting in the classroom. The teacher said, "Oh, good. I want my bright kids here, yeah, looking at the, the best children, looking at the." Certificates that we come in the high school, sit in the front, ha, I walk so proudly. <laughs> then the next thing, oh, by the way, I forgot, we must get uh, family cards. 
the family card now is a, the, 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 the way of controlling who is in the city or not there and to get out those who don't belong to the city. And unfortunately, it came one, yes, I'm here, one, two, three. Kusta Jack? No. <coughs> oh, sorry, my darling. You will have to go and sort it out. But what? <laughs> and I was like, from that moment, that's what it told me. And then I thought I would fight until that system is over. Well, you know, one thing I noticed, and this is just an aside, is that you both have vibrant, vibrant personalities, and you're both very persistent. Two qualities I, I recognized immediately in watching both of you speak. Um, but here's a question. And they look alike, right? And they look alike. <laughs> Gosh, is that true? <laughs> Their DNA looks alike. Um, I want to ask about leadership in civil resistance movements. I realize you're not students of leadership, you are leaders, so I don't expect you to be an expert on how leadership in a civil resistance movement <coughs> might be different um, from leadership in another situation. But one thing I could start you out on is that there isn't an appointed leader. You haven't been elected. No one has appointed you. And yet, there you are, and you're assuming some kind of a leadership role. What does that mean in terms of the other people in the movement? What does that mean in terms of having more than one leader? How do you balance those issues? The, I've been explaining to Eric from China. Where's Eric? Huh? Not yet. Oh, there. <laughs> I was explaining that, you see, when you feel strong about something, it bothers you <clears throat> to the point you cannot be quiet anymore. You know what? There's somebody else who's bothered by the same or something similar. And then what do you do? You get the birds of a feather together, as they say, <laughs> flock together. And then you, you start to find common ground. And then, of course, we are five here. There must be one of us is going to be the one who works hardest and, 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 and worries most about this subject is going to be ultimately maybe the one that might be eloquent to to, to, to raise our, our, our voice to the outside world. And of course, that is how you become uh, the leader that is uh, of a group. And uh, there might be contestations, but at the end of the day, you're gonna see true results and commitment and dedication who really is the genuine voice of us here in this group. I might have studied it. It doesn't follow that I am going to be the one that ends up being the leader. I mean, the guys who brought my, to be brought into the formal politics is funny, or whatever formal organization. I used to be a student uh, Christian movement leader. And through this, uh, I had a big following. First of all, I was a, a good, uh, we play rugby in our schools, in our country. Now, that's a, a very good add-on if you got something extra, those kinds of things, you're, a, you're a, a, a basket, whatever, and then you're committed to a cause. Whoa, that's a double bonus. And that's what made my life extremely, very easy because of those things. So. Um, then the, the leaders, the, the clever people who understood what they wanted, who have thought about this, were looking for, and then they, they identified me and said, you need that guy. And I said, no, I don't want to be in formal organization and so on, I'm, I'm okay where I am. And that is how actually they brought me then. From there onward, they started to make me their spokesperson in their team and so on. Sometimes I wasn't that much into their thing. They persuaded me in some of the causes, but mostly those causes were around education. And so, but for me, my main thing 
If it was for me, I would have zoomed only on the past law. Let me fight the past. They say, no, you can't just fight the past law alone. Yeah, we are with you on that. Let's put the past law in. But we got also this and that and that. That's how I got in there. Ну, э, что касается меня, вот э, Кусто рассказывает, как будто вот, при, прям про меня, вот только я в регби не играла. So for me, um, there's very little to add. Kusto was, when he was talking, I felt it's the same for me, except I didn't play rugby. А тоже все у нас было абсолютно неформально. И вы знаете, вот Оскар очень хорошо сказал, что вообще не торопятся гражданские активисты назвать себя лидерами. Это опасно, можно по голове получить, особенно вот в таких странах, как Россия, как Боливия, ну, в африканских странах. Это опасно. И не хотят себя люди очень часто вообще лидерами называть. Nobody is really rushing to call themselves a leader. You can get in big trouble, especially in countries like Russia, Bolivia, and some African countries. So it's a, um, it's something to think about. И вот в этом большое отличие от государственных или там политических лидеров. Они себя вот, они чувствуют свою защищенность, часто безнаказанность, и они себя с удовольствием лидерами там называют. And uh, that's a big difference uh, between. Um, civil leaders and political leaders, people who are running for political office, they uh, feel themselves safe, they feel their impunity, and they're very happy to call themselves leaders. They won't get in trouble. У uh, меня лидером тоже так же, как и Куста, просто стали называть. Причем я тщательно скрывала, что я вообще что-то организую, и старалась оставаться в тени. Uh, долгое время, но, но мне это не удалось все-таки. То есть uh, uh, меня стали многие люди называть лидером. И uh, мне пришлось им стать. So I was uh, um, named the leader by other people, just like Usta, and uh, I was doing my best to actually uh, stay in the shadow, to hide that I was organizing something. But um, other people started calling me a leader, and I had to step up to the plate. Хотя у меня совершенно другие цели были на тот момент. У меня было двое детей маленьких, одному пять лет, другому ребенку вообще там несколько дней, ну там несколько недель. И у меня на тот момент были абсолютно, ну другие цели, задачи. Я, собственно говоря, просто начала защищать ту территорию, на которой я живу, свою среду обитания. И uh, так получилось, что вот мои власти этим глупым решением уничтожить, ну, уничтожить лес, они просто заставили меня стать социально активным uh, человеком и заставили меня быть лидером. Um, to be quite honest, um, at that moment in time, I had very different goals. I had very different business. I had two young kids. My older daughter was five years old. My younger daughter was just a few days and maybe a few weeks old. And I, again, I had very different goals. I, di I had different thoughts, but I just, uh, the environment uh, around me was changing. It was under threat. So the authorities, uh, through that stupid decision, basically forced me to become a leader. Thank you, Mr. Putin. <laughs> And uh, uh, if it weren't for Putin, I would probably never have met you all. So thank you, Mr. Putin. Uh, I'm so happy to know Kusta, to know Oliver. Uh, again, thank you, Mr. Putin. Putin is a great help for me. Well, actually, that brings up another question. But I'm going to go back to a few others that were prepared. Um, talking about the other leaders in the movement, I think I've heard from you that it's dangerous to have one leader, only one leader. Certainly then the leadership could be decapitated as well because one leader can be arrested. You were arrested and put in jail. So it makes sense to have several leaders. And what kinds of skills do those leaders need to have? Do they have to have exactly the same skills you have, or should they have complementary skills? Um, 
you know, you, you, you can't make a, a duplicate. <laughs> Everybody is got his own stuff like that. And they will be utilized accordingly. Uh, so, yeah, what is important is that, like I say, is that there must be an equal access to the same information, information sharing, uh, transparent running of the organization, so that there is no question that, uh, Kusta, where do you hide the keys? Uh, what's up, God? People don't know where they are or what you, instead of the keys, what do you call it? Uh, whatever. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, it's true sharing honestly everything, like I say, especially this applies mostly what we talk about in what I call unprofessional leadership, unprofessional, not professional leadership, not these guys that get paid. I'm talking about people like here. You must <coughs> strive to make everything accessible to everybody, what you get, the people you meet, so that when you meet uh, diplomats or whatever, you make sure that you take your friends along, even if you, if you can't take all of them, but make sure you report back to them. And then when you speak to those diplomats, you tell them anyway that enhances you to tell them that you are not alone in this thing. Because people don't like lone, lone what do you call lone wolf or lone men. They prefer you to work with other people. So it is to your own interest. All the, the actually there's not a single good leadership uh, characteristic that is not good for you as a leader, a good one. They are all useful for you, so you can just as well spread them to other people for your own good. Ну, вы знаете, мне повезло со страной. У нас потому что сексистская страна. You know, um, I, I was uh, fortunate uh, to be living in a very uh, sexist country. Поэтому, нет, серьезно, поэтому а когда, э, если у нас обижают женщину, например, то э, вы получите, ну не знаю, раз в 20 больше распространения информации в медиа, чем если обижают мужчину. I'm being serious, so there are different statements applied to men and women, and if a woman is harassed, this will be covered widely in the media, maybe a hundred times more than if a man was beaten or harassed or abused. No, потом, конечно, естественно, поскольку экологический лидер и у меня был настоящий экологический лагерь, это как партизанская война. Конечно, были нападения и все такое. Но скажу честно, бандиты никогда у нас не били женщин, не били мужчин всегда. Вот полиция, да, они могут кого угодно ударить. То есть я физически была всегда лучше защищена, чем мужчины, которые стояли рядом со мной. Это особенность российского менталитета. То есть русский мужик, он не будет просто так женщину бить. Это, это ну, сумасшедший только если. Um, yes, I'm an environmental leader and I had a whole campaign, I had an environmental camp, we basically had a guerrilla war uh, against the authorities. But you have to know that in Russia, uh, thugs don't attack women. Uh, police can uh, arrest both men and women and uh, can beat a woman. But, um, you know, thugs that they hire, they don't really attack and the, for a Russian man. Uh, it's something out of an out of the ordinary to um, lay a hand on a woman. Для меня это было не так опасно, как если бы был мужчина, потому что долгое время у нас лидером был Миша Бикетов. Это журналист. Я показывала вам его фотографии после нападения. Его так избили, что ему ногу отрезали, пальцы отрезали. И в результате вот он умер этой весной. То есть мужчине в нашей стране намного сложнее быть лидером, намного опаснее, чем женщине. And again, uh, you know, I was fortunate. I didn't have to uh, fear for my physical safety. Uh, prior to me becoming, coming forward and becoming a leader, our leader was Misha Beketov, uh, that journalist, the picture of uh, whom I showed you earlier in the week. You remember, 
uh, he uh, had been beaten and he lost the leg and he lost four fingers. He was he had a head injury. He ultimately died from his injuries this past spring. So it's so much more dangerous for a man than for a woman. И поскольку в России это очень опасная деятельность, мне как женщине этим было заниматься более безопасно, поэтому я старалась взять на себя больше этой ответственности чтобы защитить мужчин, потому что в России скорее надо говорить про права мужчин, чем про права женщин. And um, as I said, because in Russia it's very dangerous for a man to be in any kind of opposition, I try to uh, take it upon myself. I try to uh, step forward and uh, protect the men, because in Russia we uh, really have to talk more about protecting rights of men than of women. Вот, так что были, конечно, и другие люди, которые брали на себя ответственность, и они сейчас рядом со мной. И я с удовольствием делюсь с ними э, своей ответственностью. Говорю, нате вам мой крест, несите его вместо меня. Но он почему-то этот крест все равно оказывается опять на моих плечах. Uh, so there were other people who took leadership roles, who were happy to step forward, uh, and I'm very happy to pass uh, this leadership on to them. I'm telling them, here is my cross, you carry it now. But somehow this cross always finds its way back to me. <laughs> well, in all of these situations, there were terrible setbacks and disappointments. <laughs> How do you deal with those? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. <clears throat> rugby? <laughs> <laughs> well, rugby is one thing that was common between me and the security police. Uh, you know, you, I used to, <coughs> at some point, you think that the people have just, you got them here now. You look forward, oh my goodness, now, you know, we are marching now to Pretoria now. And then you call a big meeting. We got a great hall, call it the Great Centenary Hall. Wow, this is a hall of fame, really. I mean, it's so nice when you stand there in front of it. Then we, <coughs> you call a meeting for two o'clock on Saturday. Oh, people don't come. You have prepared your speech. You are pacing up and down, waiting to look at that corner and that corner there. You will see the people full. The people are nowhere. I'm not coming. And then you look, and the police who have been outside, they see that nobody comes into the meeting, and they start to come and take this seat here in front. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the other few people who were coming in. Non-violent resistance conflict. Oh. <laughs> they see the police sitting there, they run. View, view. Who Kusta is having a meeting with the police? <laughs> <laughs> this is a rally where I'm expected to address these people and tell them about a liberation of our country. Where, 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 where? Yeah. And the police say, Comrade Chair, Comrade Chairman, they refer to me. And Comrade Kuster, are you aware <coughs> that today there's, the Springboks are playing England at 3 and 4 o'clock? Can we get on with the meeting? <laughs> you, you know, you can, we're so embarrassed. We, and they say, and then they are so happy because on Monday they will pick me up and mock me, and mock me, okay? Take me to the office. Okay, the meeting has failed. It's a disaster. I can't see my friends. I can't even go and watch the game on television. You just go and sleep. You're so good. Oh, what am I doing? And then on Monday morning, the first thing the police come at 4 o'clock, they come and pick you up. Then on, and they arrive, the others, you are already there the, in their interrogation office. And they come in the morning, they talk about it. Oh, now we were at Kuster's meeting yesterday. How did it go? Ah, man, the people are rejecting Kuster. We were the only people who believe in him. If all people don't believe him, he says they want freedom, he talks rubbish. And you, you know, things like those, they make you doubt. 
You feel like, because these very people that you want to fight for, they, they are not committed. And those were set tight. <laughs> what did you do? How did you get yourself out of the funk? Well, you either, what are you going to do? You are in it. You, 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 believe, you believe that. What do you eat? What do you do? What do you eat? What do you eat? I'm going to take notes. Tell me. Oh, no. On, on that as um, board, on, 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 uh, you, can't, you, can't uh -huh. you can't go back. Uh -huh. You can't move back. Yeah. And then what do you do? Uh -huh. You just uh, have another thing. You wait for maybe a few days. Another another company come down the line and say to you, hey, sorry, Kusta, you know, uh, man, uh, my mom was sick and, uh, and you know that actually he turned at the door there, but my mother was sick and then I had to, and uh, otherwise I'm with you, Comrade, I'm with you. Oh, yeah. But do you rethink during those moments? There were many times. Do you times. just wait for people to come back? Or do you see people? Or do you rethink? No, that meeting is gone, that one. Okay, but do you rethink what happened? You rethink? Oh, of course, what, you, what, what uh, the other people are going to tell you, the people who encourage you, they say, Kusta, just look at the way you organize the meeting. You did it wrong. Whatever. Or you didn't do enough. They say, don't blame the people, blame yourself. Find a solution in yourself as to why did this meeting become a disaster. And then you, you think then and start to tell you something new and tell you stories about what uh, in Vietnam, what they did this, how they did in the civil rights movement, that side, what did they do this and that and that. Because that is why this kind of thing here for people who are in this space is very important, believe me. Because you can see, when you see that you are not on your own, it's so nice when you see that there's somebody somewhere else doing an effort and that drives you <laughs> to get in the moment before. No, uh... Вы знаете, я поняла, что разочарование, оно очень часто связано просто с физической усталостью. You know, um, I came to realize that oftentimes disappointment is just due to exhaustion, to you being extremely tired. Я помню, что мы несколько дней оставались в лагере, и мы вынуждены были отступать, потому что силы были абсолютно не равны. То есть на этой стороне была большая техника, бандиты, полиция, ОМОН. А, а, и мы вынуждены были отступать все ближе вот к сердцу нашего леса, к Дубраве. Uh, I remember um, when we were in an uh, environmental camp and for several days we had to retreat because um, the forces on the other side were uh, so uneven, were uh, uh, so much more than we were. They had lots of equipment, they had special forces and they were pushing us out little by little. А эта Дубрава, она очень особенная для нас, потому что э, там есть освещенный родник, родник Святого Георгия. И э, там вот в сталинское время было очень много людей, которые погибли да, в сталинском лагере, их там похоронили. Но это никто не знает, там нет крестов, мы просто помним об этом. И э, много людей, которые приходят туда, они приносят из дома свои иконы, оставляют в этом месте и молятся в этом месте. Uh, and uh, they pushed us uh, to this uh, little oak grove that has a, a very important significance for us. There's a holy creek, people believe it's a holy creek. It was actually um, announced that it was holy uh, St. George. And um, uh, it, it um, was there from the times of the Stalin gulags. Many people even don't know about it, but many people died in that camp and that labor camp and were buried there. So uh, the population brings icons, they pray there. И вот по этому месту, представьте себе, должны пройти бульдозеры. And imagine they're gonna run bulldozers right across. И вот бульдозер едет прямо на Дубраву. И я встаю у него на пути. 
so the bulldozers, the bulldozer is uh, coming to the middle of this old grove, and um, I am uh, throwing myself in front of it. But не от большого ума, а просто потому что там ребята, которые были рядом со мной, и бандиты били в этот момент, и бандиты кончились, и у меня была возможность как бы у одной вот к этому бульдозеру подойти. Uh, not because I'm particularly smart or particularly brave, it's just there weren't enough thugs to be manhandling all of us. So when the thugs were busy with the men, I found a moment to actually uh, go in front of that uh, piece of equipment. I had a bulldozer прямо валит дубы. И я думаю, вот я стою перед ним и думаю, у него не хватит силы воли не остановиться. Думаю, сейчас он остановится. А он не остановился. So the bulldozer is cutting down trees and I'm thinking um, the bulldozer has to stop or is, he, or is it determined enough not to stop and it actually didn't stop. Ну и я тогда получила свою первую травму. This is how I got my first injury. И вот когда уже после больницы меня принес муж домой, то, конечно, и это было очень тяжело, потому что я не могла быть с моими товарищами, и я лежала вот с больной ногой, я должна была теперь на косты, ну, на, с костылями ходить, то есть это все было, это все было очень неприятно. So when I was discharged from the hospital and my husband virtually carried me home, um, I, I, I felt terrible. I had to stay in bed. I couldn't support my comrades, my friends. Uh, I had to use the crutches, and um, I was in a really difficult uh, condition and difficult state of mind. No, I realized that you need to be just умнее yeah? и надо сохранять свою физическую форму, потому что лидер обязан быть всегда в хорошей форме, в хорошем настроении, потому что главная задача лидера это не получить все травмы возможные, а на самом деле иметь силы для того, чтобы вдохновить людей. And um, at that moment I realized that um, in the future I'll have to be smarter because Uh, for a leader, uh, it's not important to get all the possible injuries, but it is important to preserve yourself, to preserve your physical health, because you actually have to be there to mobilize the people. И я поменяла свою тактику, то есть я стала намного больше времени проводить со своими детьми, со своим мужем, и у меня появились еще какие-то хобби, то есть у меня жизнь перестала быть одним только химкинским лесом, и вот эти другие миры, они дают мне силу. Ну и, конечно, я занялась спортом. Я стала бегать каждый день быстро, э, и форма стала лучше. И я теперь могу отскочить, если там бульдозер едет, или там мульчер работает, или харвестер. То есть э, э, физическое состояние очень важно. And um, I decided to change my tactics, uh, and I decided to try to cherish every moment I have with my family, spend more time with my children, uh, spend more time with my husband. I uh, realized that I need to have other things in my life. Uh, uh, defending Himke Forest cannot just be an uh, overarching thing. So I um, started uh, taking care of myself, I uh, started exercising, I jog now, I jog fast and uh, I can jump away from the bulldozer or from the bulldozer very fast. So you use this setback again in order to learn, in order to um, be more successful in your fight. Ну, конечно, и вы знаете, я, честно говоря, в какие-то тяжелые моменты перечитываю сайт, где пишут многодетные мамы, у которых там по 10, по 11 детей, и беру их советы. Вот у них совет такой, что у тебя всегда должно быть еще немножко энергии, поэтому если ты сильно устал, то отдохни, потому что злая орущая на всех женщина это ужасно это это намного хуже ну, ну я еще не знаю чем Путин так что лучше лучше вообще сохранять энергию и быть спокойным и вообще контролировать свое состояние um, yes of course and um, you know when um, uh, I find myself in a difficult state of mind what I do is I go to the sites to the forums where um, 
mothers with multiple children exchange ideas and tips and those are women who have maybe 10 or 11 children and their advice is usually at some point when you're ready to kill your kids you just step back because there's nothing worse than a mean and screaming mother maybe just president putin uh, <laughs> But seriously, uh, you have to preserve your energy and you have to take care of yourself and you have to have that little reserve. Yeah, I'm going to ask one more question and then I think instead of saving the question and answer period to the end, we'll have it in the middle and then I'll finish up with some questions. But you're talking about being ill and other leaders having to take over, and you're talking about being arrested and other leaders having to take over. Sometimes a leader is permanently ill or permanently, almost permanently arrested, and they become symbolic leaders. What is the role of a symbolic leader in a civil existence? Yeah, it can be, a, I mean, of the cases that are, okay, there's a case of Tibet, where they got the Dalai Lama, who is, uh, I think everyone in the world knows that uh, he, he is a legitimate leader that is being uh, muzzled. And there is uh, also the, the story of Western Papua, where a leader who, um, who organized a march of 10,000 or 20,000 people get killed after that. Those are the trigger points which uh, uh, allows you to replay that kind of message showing the injustice that has been done in order to rally people. Because the people will always be scared that this is going to happen to them. And it is easy to try and stop it from a distance. So in our case, every time I, got a, I was arrested, uh, the biggest blow to me was, uh, was to fail my last school, university, uh, school, I failed. Now, that was a major blow for me because uh, before I've never failed. I've never, I always, I was good in my schoolwork, but how I failed because the police arrested me on the day I was writing exams. So I didn't write exams, so I failed. You're gonna fail if you don't write exams. So that was a, a psychological big blow to me. But um, understanding that there were people by this time who have made uh, all kinds of achievements in society, but they were all thrown away in jail, being useless. With uh, some of them were highly educated, and so on and so on. So that. Uh, encourage me to pick myself up and believe that I must just walk on and stop complaining. Blaming these people, don't worry. They arrested me because I believe in their cause. They believe in their cause to stop me, so that's it. So that's how I went on. So I think uh, personally, it's uh, you, The, the, and then, of course, on numerous occasions, after 79, I got arrested in 78, and then the students rallied everybody else for my freedom. <coughs> and then the police now, everybody arrives. And you sit in prison, you hear that the president of a country explaining that, why he must keep you in jail, how nice it is. <laughs> because of the, the people uh, uh, were not going to school across the country because until I'm released. And they take us, they put us in a different, about a thousand miles away from our homes. And then you, you feel like, oh my goodness, this thing is good. And also, of course, right through that became a repeat. Every time we're inside, they call for the release of those people. But in our case, or in any case, you will have immediate <coughs> leaders that are being arrested now. You want them to be free because they've broken no law. And of course, also, you've got the bigger picture of the release of the big fish, which they got. In our case, Nelson Mandela. Yes. And Mandela becomes now the rallying point. But for the people to stand up, because Mandela has been in jail for more than 20 years by that time, <coughs> the parent people are quiet. But they are not going to stand up for Mandela 
the ordinary people here staying in the local place. No, Mandela is too big in their minds. But if, if Kenya, she's got arrested, they know her in this place, then they're gonna, they're gonna uh, stand up for her. And then you can bring the bigger picture on the back of her. That's how it went. So you will, then those things become the rallying point of that nation. For example, I think if, if the police now <coughs> arrest, let's say who here now, um, let's say Oscar get thrown in jail now uh, for, for what is said here in the United States. The people in Bolivia are going to say, whoa, 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 you, I'm scared now because they've taken this guy next door because they know him, okay? The, you see, the best thing for a leader is to be rooted somewhere. You must be the same as the people that you are working for. You mustn't be different from them. You mustn't walk different. You mustn't talk differently. You must embrace them. You must embrace their way of life. You must embrace their culture. Then that is why when you are arrested or something happened to you, they get scared because you are with us. He's one of us. <laughs> Ну, вы знаете, есть в физике такой закон, это, по-моему, второй закон Ньютона, что сила действия равна силе противодействия. Может, третий, я не помню, как он по счету. You know, there's a law of physics, I don't remember, is it second or third law, that, uh, you know, uh, force equals resistance. И uh, есть такой же закон в обществе, чем сильнее uh, давят на общество, тем сильнее будет ответ. And I think it uh, can be extrapolated to society. Uh, the more they uh, pressure people, uh, the more resistant people will become. Я из страны, где, ну, не так давно, ну, буквально там, может, 50 лет назад, были обалденно сильные репрессии. Вот, вот просто безумно сильные репрессии против гражданского общества. У нас пол страны в лагерях сидела. I come from the country uh, which um, fairly recently, maybe just 50 years ago, <coughs> exercised terrible repressions against its uh, population. Um, maybe half of the country uh, was uh, jailed in labor camps. Людей могли посадить просто за то, что они являются членами семьи врага народа. Uh, people could be put in jail for just being uh, a family member of uh, what they called the enemy of the people. У нас людей пытали, что только с людьми не сделали, как только над ними не издевались. Их превратили, по сути, в рабов. People were tortured. Uh, they were, uh, there were horrible um, situation and uh, people were uh, brought down to the position of slaves virtually. Могли посадить на то, чтобы прочитали книгу или там фильм посмотреть. You could be jailed for reading a book that was prohibited or uh, seeing a forbidden movie. Это было не только в сталинское время, это было довольно долго. And uh, it wasn't just under Stalin, uh, it continued after him. It was a long period of time. И это время все равно закончилось, хотя у нас было вырезано все активное мужское население, которое могло реально ответить на это насилие. But uh, that time ended, despite the fact that uh, a lot of, a bigger part of the most active, the most uh, enthusiastic population was uh, virtually killed, the population that could potentially respond uh, to those purges. Я не знаю, почему это происходит, но это так. Действительно, uh, империи, основанные на насилии, они почему-то разрушаются. I don't know why that happens, but it looks like uh, the empires that uh, are based on uh, violence, that are based on repression, they come to an end, they crumble. И еще есть одно уникальное свойство у людей, которое приносит себя в жертву. There's also, um, there are the, also those unique people that sacrifice themselves for the bigger cause. Но здесь, конечно, самый главный для меня герой – это Иисус Христос. My biggest hero is Jesus Christ. Потому что, когда Он показывал чудеса, то Его идеи не распространились, идеи ненасилия не распространялись широко. 
uh, so he was uh, demonstrating miracles, however, his uh, ideas of non-violence did not spread as widely. Но когда он три дня умирал на кресте, умирал в муках uh, и принес себя в жертву, эти идеи стали распространяться. Вы знаете, если бы он нокаутировал Пилата, то никакого христианства бы и не было. But when he was suffering on the cross for three days, uh, th those ideas did spread out. Uh, and um, you know, if he uh, knocked out uh, Pilates, um, that wouldn't have happened. И uh, я вижу, как меняются люди uh, из-за того, что они приносят эту жертву. Вот у меня прекрасный пример это Ходорковский, конечно. He sacrificed himself. Uh, Jesus Christ sacrificed himself. And I have another good example. Uh, Michael Khodorkovsky. Это человек, который работал с Путиным, а потом решил бросить ему вызов и сказал, ну сколько же можно, чтобы наша великая страна жила за счет природных ресурсов, за счет нефти. Давайте менять эту ситуацию. Uh, he was a Russian oligarch who worked with Putin, but at some point he decided to challenge him. He basically said, how long can we live based on the exploitation of our natural resources? Let's build something, let's change this. И uh, он сел в тюрьму, то есть он уже сидит там 8 лет, и сколько лет еще присидит, неизвестно. Но очень интересно поменялось отношение к Михаилу Кудаковскому. Um, he's in jail now. He's been in jail for eight years. Uh, nobody knows uh, how long he will stay in jail. But it's interesting to uh, see how the attitude of people change towards this man. No, I don't know. Сложно найти народ, который бы так ненавидел олигархов, как русские. It's hard to find the people who is more hateful of oligarchs uh, as Russians. И первое время люди очень uh, радовались, ага, олигарх, он сидит в тюрьме. And initially people were very happy that he was put in jail. They said, oh, finally, an oligarch in prison, great. Но с течением времени людей начало меняться отношение к Михаилу Ходорковскому сейчас. Но он, ну, чуть не клик святых у нас причислен, то есть ему сочувствует вся страна. И если имидж Путина, он потихонечку сдувается, то образ Ходорковского, он становится все выше, и все больше людей проникаются его идеями. And uh, it's interesting to watch how as time went by, people's attitude towards Michael Khodorkovsky uh, started to change, started to change, uh, to be much more positive. To some people, he is almost a saint now. The population at large is very sympathetic to him now. And as uh, prestige and support for Putin goes out, the support for Khodorkovsky and sympathy goes out. Но самое главное меняется сам Khodorkovsky. Это невероятно, но вот вы знаете, когда там он был там 10 лет назад, я смотрю на съемки, он такой, ну знаете, такой всем довольный, такой олигарх, такой довольно неприятный. А когда сейчас на него смотришь, да, вот человек, смотришь на человека, который в тюремной камере провел 8 лет, у него просветленное лицо, это другой человек, это вот их нельзя сравнивать, его 10 лет назад и его сейчас. То есть у него какое-то ощущение произошло в этой тюрьме. То есть он просто поменялся как личность. And uh, it's even more interesting to see how Khodorkovsky himself has changed. If you look at some uh, videos 10 years from 10 years ago, uh, he's this self-satisfied guy. He is a typical oligarch and it's uh, totally unpleasant to even look at him. Now, after eight years in jail, he has an inspired face. It uh, almost feels like he has gone through some purification process. And uh, it, it's really interesting to see how he himself changed into a different person. And you know, I believe that all these victims are not wrong, and that this victim is the greatest weapon. And um, to be honest, I uh, really believe that those sacrifices are not in vain, and that's a, a powerful weapon in our struggle. You know, many people believe that very successful leaders need to go through some period of wilderness, <coughs> some period of being lost, of being left alone, and having to figure things out. Anyway, um, 
you're all leaders. <laughs> and this is about you, actually. So let's have you ask questions. I will just ask you, please, to make them about leadership, because that's the topic of this session. Yes, yes, hello. Thank you. Um, so yeah, um, we were talking about leadership and resistance um, and leaders. And I wonder, because we hear today about leaderless revolution, leaderless movement. So I was wondering what you think. Is there such an animal? Is it an effective tool to impact the public? Because today we don't have like a one coherent uh, unite movement. We have different subgroups, different sub-movements. Um, so yeah, I wonder if there is something. You know, when you start, I don't think you need to benchmark yourself against uh, the greatest leaders. You don't start, that's not the right place to start. You are a leader for the task at hand. And I think we need to, that's all what you, you, you concentrate on. Because a lot of people all over the world tend these days to say, okay, if you're going to be a leader, you must be a Mandela. No way, you don't go to be a you won't be a Mandela. That's not what you are. You are yourself. And you make a contribution at your level anyway. Mandela started where you are. He was nobody. <laughs> he was nobody. When he came to school, the English, he meant nothing. They changed his name. They said, what's your name? Said, Holika. They said, nonsense. You are Nelson. You can't write that thing. Your name. <laughs> That's it. I mean, if he was a powerful man as he is today, do you think they would have changed his name and said he's Nelson? They wouldn't. So every you, 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 there's no you. We will defeat our purpose if we benchmark ourselves against that. You oh look that guy how he is. You want to jump and no, it doesn't work like that. You gotta be yourself, and it is true being yourself that you're gonna be you're gonna achieve and uh, people when they say there's no leadership it's because they want leaders that are are like these leaders they admire but I say that's not correct uh, I anyway these days I've read a lot of uh, my quotes who will, uh, have moved away from posts of struggle and all that they are tend to be more business like <laughs> because uh, like uh, Virginia, but I'm still a, an active businessman, so I need a lot of business. I wanted to say to achieve to achieve extraordinary uh, uh, goals, you don't need to be to do extraordinary things or be extraordinary. You get just to be yourself, do just the ordinary things, and you're gonna find yourself in a place achieving the same goals. Вы знаете, я из страны, где после революции было уничтожено такое количество людей в ГУЛАГах, что вот я спокойно это слово слышать не могу. Я ненавижу революцию. You know, I come from a country uh, where after the revolution so many people perished in gulags and labor camps that um, I really hate this word, revolution. I always associate it with the destruction of the best of all. I don't feel like I'm not a leader in any kind of revolution. My path is evolution, and I'm the most important thing in the world, the saving of our planet. Because the challenge of the 21st century is not the right of a human being, not the right of women, gay, and other things. We lose our planet, and this is what we lose. And um, I don't consider myself uh, the leader of a revolution. I consider myself an evolutionary leader. Um, I am doing the main uh, task of the 21st century, and that's, that's the main uh, challenge of the 21st century: is uh, saving our planet, saving our environment. In the 21st century, uh, the challenges are not the great. The, major challenges are not human rights or women's rights or gay rights, it's the uh, environmental protection. Mary, I have the lights on the board. This is actually baloney um, in American slang. It, 
Nonviolent movements are leader full. They're full of leaders. This is a complete misconception. People look at Gandhi and King. They think you have to be exceptional and charismatic and uh, so on and so forth. Gandhi and King had illiterate or semi-literate constituencies. They had to explain complicated logic and systems of fighting with nonviolent methods to people who couldn't read and write in large part. That's part of why they were so big. But movements themselves filled with leadership and have to be because no one can order someone else in a nonviolent movement to do something. I can't say, Sivan, you're going to jail on Tuesday. <laughs> it has to come from you. You have to stand up and say, I'm ready to go to jail on Tuesday. So they're filled with leadership. Uh, yes, my Mr. Shun, Mr. Glass. I completely disagree with you. <laughs> leader, leader должен быть charismatician. I think that a leader has to have a charismatic nature. Dr. Lawson, charismatic человек, с ним приятно общаться. Лидер должен быть теплый, он должен привлекать к себе людей. От него должна исходить радость. С ним рядом с ним должно быть хорошо. Это не может быть серая мышь, извините. Если я что-то несу, если я вас вдохновляю, я не могу быть обычной. Я должна быть не такой, как все. Тогда вы меня слушаете, со мной интересно, со мной хорошо. А если я серая, как Путин, то со мной скучно. Вы не пойдете рядом со мной на бульдоз. Um, I, I think that uh, a leader has to be charismatic. Look at Dr. Lawson. He's a very charismatic person. Uh, leader has to be warm, has to bring joy to people around him. Nobody is going to be attracted to a gray mouse uh, personality um, uh, like Putin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, if, if you are this gray mouse personality, uh, will people follow you? Will people be attracted to you? Will you inspire people? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I was writing it down. I think you were next, Nora. Um, I've, I've seen uh, a lot of causes destroyed by the, by the pressure um, that are put on leaders, including people trying to, to use leaders for their own purposes, and also things like, uh, like um, awards. You know, a lot of awards are for one individual only, um, when in fact, and, and you can't even give it to the whole movement and so on, and this can cause rifts within the movement. It can also give rise to egos, um, and, and that can have a really detrimental impact on the movement. So how do you, how do you resist, you know, your ego <laughs> rising, and how do you, how do you resist uh, that pressure from, from outside to use you perhaps in, in different ways. I just pray to God. Потому что на самом деле это все есть совершенно вот в любом человеке есть эго. И мы перестаем быть благодарными. Мы перестаем мы перестаем говорить спасибо тем людям, которые рядом с нами, и мы считаем, что вот то, что они рядом с нами, это вот так и должно быть. Мы перестаем говорить спасибо. Вот как только вы начинаете ценить тех людей, которые рядом с вами, и благодарными, то ваше эго, оно вот это... I think every person has an ego, but at some point uh, we stop being grateful for the support of the people we have uh, around us. We stop appreciating those people. So um, if you if you um, appreciate those people, if you say thank you to them, uh, then your ego uh, kind of retreats. Uh, let me just go back to the issue of uh, charismatic. I think for purposes of Good this wish. <laughs> for purposes of this discussion here, we won't go into that, but I want just to say this that uh, without defining what a charismatic leader or whatever, 
I wouldn't agree with that statement. I think uh, Lydia says that the leader has to be uh, charismatic. I just wanted to point that out because by charismatic, let's assume you mean that a bubbly and all that person like me and you. Because the two of us I was going are, to ask you if you thought the two of us are, are those people that are said to be forward. Ah, forward, 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 always, you see? But you don't, that's not a, 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 a necessarily the old, the, a, a, a characteristic of leadership. It helps if you got it, and then you stay on the line. So my view is that uh, anybody can be a leader. What is needed is through your conduct, through your behavior, those you lead are going to trust you. And it boils down to one thing. How do those who follow you view you? Exactly. Regardless, you could be a quiet person, you could be a bubbly person, you could be whatever you are, that it boils down to that. That's my view about that. So in other words, what I'm saying, trust, trust, trust to a leader. The people must trust you. If they trust you, that what you say today, you say tomorrow, even if the fire is put on top of your head, that is the bottom line. That is a sign of leadership. That is a characteristic of a leader. Uh, ego, like I said, some of these things like egos and things, they are to your own detriment. If you get seduced by them, I mean, you're going to have a short uh, span. And uh, people are not going to, you will be nobody very quickly. It's rather stick to the basics of doing what you have to do to the best of your ability without rising on the top of anybody else, without exploiting the weaknesses of other people, without ridiculing other people, and always be yourself the way you are. I believe it is to your own good that you don't have this kind of egoistic mind because you will fall by the way. You, it's important for others to trust <coughs> you, but you must trust others as well, as Mary is saying, that it's really important that you trust the other leaders in the movement and that you encourage them so that you have leadership across the across the whole movement. Wow, that's my the And then they know and they understand the principles and the goals, so you are constantly having to say to them, oh, you know, don't forget that, or do this when you go there. So when you're in jail, um, some of your followers begin to use violence, right? Yeah, yeah of course. And ideally, they all would have been leaders, and they would have understood the philosophy of the movement, and this wouldn't have happened. No? no well, look, uh, that comes to the contradictions that are there. It's in a cut. I mean, all the time, look here now, we, most of the things we agree, but you will find that maybe there will be something that we don't agree on. And obviously, if she steps in, let's say I am not supporting violence, and she supports violence, and I have been the person yeah. that... <laughs> no. <laughs> and I no. have been the person not that... that. <laughs> okay, let's say Putin supports violence. <laughs> yeah. And then he comes in. Obviously, what is in him is what is going to push. Those are the, uh, the, the individual preferences but that a person can move. But if there are no sufficient uh, uh, force behind him to pull him back from, uh, the, from our, our, our charted course and take us off course, then he's going to run. But if there's somebody who can rein him, it will be okay. We'll get back into basics. Anna? Yes. Um, like people are, are, are like is traveling all over the world, looking for more open and participatory and horizontal spaces. So, um, like I'm, I'm wondering if, if somehow this concept of leader, people, no, this vertical structure that you are presenting in here, it doesn't somehow replicate this structure that somehow people are fighting against. And uh, like another thought is like, uh, like I, I think leaders should 
or this concept of leader to me is more like organizers, the leaders, uh, should mobilize people and people should like follow and believe in the struggle, not in the leader, because then you are like following a person, not, not, not a, a, a your cause or your struggle. So to withstand this concept of, of talking about leaders rather than talking about organizers, um, it contributes to replicate the same models that we are all struggling against. Это очень сильно зависит от ситуации, в какой стадии сейчас находится ваше движение. But it really depends a lot on the on your particular situation, at what stage your movement is currently. Одно дело, когда вы, например, проводите там серию судов или там серию каких-то мирных акций, протестов, это одна ситуация. It's one thing uh, if you are uh, filing lawsuits against somebody or if you are conducting a series of uh, peaceful uh, marches or events. Другое дело, когда вы в лесу и вам надо подойти к многотонной работающей машине, окруженной бандитами, которые уничтожают что-нибудь ценное для вас. It's another thing if you find yourself in an environmental camp in a forest and suddenly there's this huge multi-ton piece of equipment that's going to destroy something that's uh, near and dear to your heart and you have to make a choice to come up to it, to throw yourself down in front of it. И кто-то должен взять на себя ответственность, сказать, ребята, построились, вот ты встал здесь, ты встал здесь, и мы идем. И кто-то должен пойти вперед и принять на себя этот удар. Кто-то должен это сделать. Это невозможно сделать все вместе. То есть, ну, просто физически как бы нельзя. Я пробовала, не получается. Вы идете все вместе, но кто-то ведет, кто-то должен сделать этот первый посыл. И это всегда, в моем случае, лидер. Потому что э, я никогда, ну... Я никогда не предлагаю чего-то такого, в чем не участвую сама. Но без меня не пойдут. Ну не пойдут, ну страшно. Кто-то должен идти впереди. But in this situation, somebody has to take the first step. Somebody has to say, let's get together, let's let's go, let's move. Uh, you know, um, that, that takes leadership, leadership uh, personality, leadership skills. Somebody has to do the first step because otherwise it's not going to be done. There is a lot of fear, it's scary. And um, I, I uh, speak from experience because I never suggest something that I myself haven't, have, have done or wouldn't do. So just, uh, I went, uh, I know that we, from, from the beginning here, we never propagated any vertical leadership at all in what we have said here. Honestly, mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't come into the, and secondly, <coughs> and the supremacy of the cause go, it goes without saying that it's like that. So I don't, if you want, I mean the cause that you want to put on, of course, that's what has been discussed here most of the time. But the topic now, or the debate is supposedly, supposedly attempting to look at those people in leadership. And we're looking at the a way of, say, to strengthen people here who are in leadership, which they are. And they have to do this job because the cause cannot drive itself. It has to be driven by these people. And what we have been doing is to try and discuss those matters and that says to the best of all. We are not discussing the cause and we are not saying that the cause comes with subordinate to a leader or all that. Not at least us. Have you talked about how yeah, important yeah. it was to communicate? Yeah. Um, and to keep people on board. So how do you do that? Um, I once led a, a movement myself, <laughs> and it was also against development. Yeah. And it, was, it was against the expansion of a, of a road into a highway. It was going to take down a lot of homes and put up an industrial park. So it took me, I think I was in it, five years. We won, we actually won. But it was probably my first experience in the practice of leadership. But one thing we did was that as we identified people who were playing a big role, we had these weekly meetings around the big table. And actually, anybody could come, but we would invite people who we knew were playing important roles. And in some sense, we knew what roles 
had to be played. Um, like some people had to communicate. Somebody had to have some legal skills. We actually needed somebody to go out. We sent this 85-year-old lady to count cars um, one full day. Uh, but those meetings became extremely important and they were a lot of fun. We ate a lot, we talked a lot. It was one of the happiest times of my life. Um, did you do things like this? Did you pull everybody together at a common table? Um, a fluid situation, but also this constant communication and hearing from the others, conversation so that it wasn't just one person saying this is the way we're headed. I don't have to repeat what you said. We have just to do that. Division of labor is critical. And it's almost something because you instinctively for example, know. You see, if, if I were to have, of the people that I see here, if we were to, our chair now, okay guys, let's go. We're going to go to West Papua. Okay. I will tell you from the people who spoke here, and other people I think they have the same observation, they're going to help me. I'm going to say, okay, we got and 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 Sarah, and Kayla, it's a queen for me, and Kayla, I read it my own way, and Kayla, okay, she is going to be in charge of making sure that everybody is there on time, and that is what is going to happen. And somebody is going to say, no, Kuska, you're wrong. <laughs> somebody is going to say, Kuska, you're wrong. I've been observing her. She has been arriving late every day. So, <laughs> and, then, and then I move back again. OK, I say, OK. Somebody says, no, I think Tenzin is the right man for that job. Because what? You see? That, uh, to illustrate what you're saying, I'm saying there's no other way you're going to do it that way. Anyway, you cannot succeed if you're going to run and, uh, 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 with people who are free, who don't depend on you, who are not being paid by you. You think you're going to just exactly. give that instruction? And that's why you bake those cookies. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so everything you said, I don't care. And you know, I, I didn't stand in front of a bulldozer, but I was up for tenure at my university that year. And um, the head of the company that we were stopping, trying to stop, was the chairman of the board of the university. And you talk about the need for other leaders. So at that meeting, exactly prior to when my tenure case was going to be in front of him, other people stepped forward in that meeting, and I didn't. I sat back that time, and they, they protected me, and there were other times when I protected them. But to be doing it alone, I probably would have lost my job. So, yeah, having a lot of people who, who will um, do uh, many different tasks and step in for each other, and I think a lot about it as teams, because you do believe in this cause, and you do believe in each other, and you don't want the cause to lose anybody. So you step in for people when they can't do it. You know, when you're injured, somebody steps in for you. Um, when you're in jail, you know, somebody, or maybe many people step in. Anyway, I don't think we've had a, a guy ask a question. This is unusual. I love it. I'm mean, afraid I missed the early part of the session. I don't know where to be, but so I may have missed something. But I'd just like to throw into uh, as the speakers uh, something for their comment. In my experience, I wouldn't say I was a follower, but somebody in the lower rank of the uh, mass movement and also the clandestine movement. The most important quality of a leader for me was somebody who could listen and hear. Because as somebody in the ranks, I was expected to do certain things, often without having the resources to do so, or in a difficult situation. And somebody who could actually listen and hear and respond that was the first part of communication. That was the sine qua non. That was the ultimate necessity that the person be able to listen and hear. And the leaders who were effective, in my experience, and the leaders who commanded the respect of other people in the rank were people who could listen and hear. <laughs> I'd like to say something that Emiliano Zapata said in Mexico many, many years ago. He said that an organized people doesn't need leaders. O sea, leaders in the perspective of that leader, 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 of that 
ese liderazgo, ese tipo de liderazgo no es necesario con un pueblo organizado. So this type of leadership and when you have one charismatic leader or uh, is it necessary when people are truly organized? Yo creo que cuando Justa, Genia, yo y otros hermanos y hermanas aquí. When I, I think that when Justa, Genia, other brothers and sisters here. Cuentan un poco el rol que han asumido, que están asumiendo hoy día. When we talk about the role that we played and the role that we're playing today, yo creo que ante todo es una responsabilidad. I think above all we're talking about a responsibility. Y que tiene que estar todo en función de ese nuevo tipo de organización que Ana un poco reclamaba que debemos ir construyendo. And I think it has to be at the service of this new form of organization that, to some extent, Anna was talking about and that we're looking for, and that we have to try to be building little by little. Es que los nuevos tiempos exigen eh, un nuevo tipo de liderazgo que ante todo sea colectivo. I think that the new times that we're living in are demanding a new type of leadership that above all is collective. Es decir, que esa responsabilidad sea una responsabilidad eh, Temporal. In other words, that this responsibility that one assumes is a temporary responsibility. Revocable en cualquier momento. And it can be revoked in any moment. Y ante todo rotatorio. And above all, it should rotate. En Cochabamba ocurrió eso. Fue así la responsabilidad y no hubieron líderes visibles, necesarios, importantes, imprescindibles. In Cochabamba, that's what happened. Uh, it, it was it, it, it rotated, and there weren't these higher-up leaders that were um, that were uh, absolutely necessary and that couldn't be removed. Y ante todo esa responsabilidad tiene que estar sujeta a un espacio de rendición de cuentas en su conducta. And above all, this responsibility has to be linked to accountability in one's conduct. Eso eso sirve mucho para la fuerza, la fortaleza y la confianza y la experiencia de todos en, la, en, en, en asumir tareas. And this is, this is very important, the trust and the experience of, of people as they are assuming tasks. Inclusive el nombre de la organización eh, de manera simbólica tiene mucha influencia. Even the name of an, organiz of an organization actually has a lot of influence on this. Por eso digo yo que es necesario construir también eh, palabras o devolverle a las palabras la verdadera significación. So I also think that's why it's necessary to have words or to return to words their, their true meanings. En nuestra organización se llamó la coordinadora del agua. Our, the name of our organization was the coordinate, the coordinating committee for water. Um, y cuando nos apresaron a los, a los responsables eh, principales de la coordinadora, Toda la gente que estaba en el movimiento asumió esa responsabilidad y no pasó nada cuando nos tomaron presos. And since, uh, since everybody in the movement was assuming responsibilities, when we, the leadership of the movement, were arrested, nothing happened to the organization. Todos asumían que eran la coordinadora. Todos decían nosotros y nosotras somos la coordinadora. Everybody had, was, was, was very convinced of this idea of the coordinating committee. We are all the coordinators. Inclusive mucha gente pensó que la coordinadora era una mujer. And the word, the word coordinating committee in Spanish, coordinadora, it's feminine in Spanish, so people kept calling it the coordinadora, and people thought it was a woman. Y mucha gente decía, ¿cuándo va a dar la cara esa mujer valiente que está dirigiendo el movimiento? So people kept asking, when are we going to finally get to see the face of this famous woman who's leading the movement? Entonces, esa, esa percepción de la gente de que la coordinadora es la fuerza invisible pero concreta que esté nosotros mismos es muy importante. So this idea that the, the, the coordinator was this invisible but ever present force inside of us all is very important. No, Okay, we're, we're about done and I know that you've had a problem uh, staying to schedule. So I'm going to th thank both of you. Your not only great leaders and great causes, but you're extremely personable and vibrant and fun to listen to. Um, as, as a leader here at the school, or one of many, I have a lot of tasks, and one of the tasks is running this program I mentioned earlier where I teach a course on foreign policy leadership. <coughs> 
and we have a lot of brochures here about the Global Master Bots program. Dan um, was a student in the Global Master Bots program. Several members of ICNC have applied to the year-long internet-mediated residency program. So I have um, been selfish, or rather I've been true to my cause, and I've brought Adeline Wong and Mariana Strancheva along who represent the program and we have a stack of brochures and I hope you'll take one during the break and have a conversation um, with them. And we have one person here whose wife is going to start the program this summer. So please think about us. And uh, this conversation about leadership I think was very instructive and we got to the core of so many of the debates about leadership. So thank you.